delay you getting started. So anytime cool. you're ready. Oh, awesome. Sounds great. So I will just introduce myself as part of the as part of the uh, talk. But I'm, I'm also supposed to do that if you'd like me to, but uh, if you would, you're yeah, willing yeah. to go right ahead. I'll just do it. It's a lot easier. Quick introduction. Hi, I'm Shing. Um, I am an analog game designer, and you will hear a lot more about that during my actual talk. I am also giving this talk from my workshop, which is shared with several carpenters. Um, Zoom's generally pretty go good with noise filtering, but uh, if there's a sudden loud nap noise, I am very sorry. That is what's going on. Uh, all right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, so we can jump right into it. Uh, I'll talk for about 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll have some questions. And I think this will all work out great. All right. So this is a talk about uh, object narratives and keepsake games. And I will explain all of these things really soon. But at the heart of it is the question of how do we tell stories with things? Sorry, dog, dog issues. Give me one second. All right, there you go. All right. Hi. Welcome. My name is Shing Yinkor, and I am a cartoonist and an experienced designer. This is a field which covers immersive theater, it covers large scale interactive art, and of course, it also covers games. So I'm going to start off um, by talking about my background in building large scale installation art, and specifically the kind of prop building work that goes into making deliberate and intimate immersive environments that invite exploration and curiosity. And that also delivers small pieces of a narrative for an audience to reassemble together. And that's to give you a background into the thought process of what keepsake games are and why I choose to make them. These are both art forms that revolve very deeply around tangible objects. Uh, this is still very applicable if you're doing any environment design or prop design for games, because digital or analog, we are all just building worlds. I am an analog designer though, so that's what I am mostly talking about here. So we're gonna talk about world building and the objects that exist in the worlds that we build and how we can make objects that are interesting narrative objects, both in the context of the environments they exist in, but also in and of themselves. So this is the bulletin board. That was in one of my art installations. Um, and every prop here was made by me, one of my crew, or an audience member or a player who participated in the creation of the piece just by being there and by being part of it and feeling an impulse to contribute to the work, which is what uh, I try and make work that encourages that. Super quick, this is one of my first art installations. It was an abandoned shack called The Last Outpost. It was installed out in Burning Man in 2011, I think. My timing might be a little bit uh, off. This particular installation used really simple and repetitive elements to create cohesion. So we used a lot of jars. We used a lot of video. Uh, we used a lot of signs. This was actually inspired directly from video games. We wanted to create the feeling of uh, looking around a room in a first person video game and deciding to pause to read the signs. I feel like I've really come full circle as someone who loves video games. So, so much of my early immersive installation work was inspired by the language and by the art of video games. And it still very much is. And then doing all of this installation work actually led to me now being a game designer using the language of immersive installation work. So really both these fields are absolutely feeding into each other. For instance, this is not a still from a low res first person shooter. It is an actual physical room that I've built. Um, this is another view which you can see just a little more clearly that all this is just paint and wood. Uh, but you, yeah, you can totally see it. It's like, it's like a low poly model, um, except the polygons here are made out of plywood um, and paint. So back to the science in my first project. This was just an old guinea pig enclosure, but in this context, it is a story. And we did it by one sign and also by destroying the cage. Uh, my guinea pigs at this point were already long dead. No pigs were harmed in the creation of this prop. These just spray painted soup cans. We brought them in world with paper labels. These are all extremely simple and easy to build props. We just made so many of them 
and really populated these spaces with a ton of the kind of detritus that makes the space feel really lived in. So this is a last apothecary. It was installed in the desert, Burning Man again, and it's an outer space apothecary. Here's another picture of some of the props there. Um, it was an outer space apothecary that was built to look like it existed inside a shipping container. Um, it was not actually in a shipping container. That would have made things a lot easier, but we actually built everything from scratch. This is my dog when uh, she's not groomed. If you have forgotten what she looked like when she is, huge difference. Um, some other things in this installation included custom postcards you could mail, uh, diseased unicorn horns, dental casts, and more. So here's that diseased unicorn horn I was talking about. Uh, and here's some dental cast of small humanoid creatures. All right, now we're gonna get into uh, how all those transitions to games. So this is Space Salvage Station. It was installed in a forest. This was built with a hundred children and some adult staff members, but a hundred children built this thing. Um, it was built at a summer camp in New Hampshire. And it was a chance to try out intentional world building with these kids. And at this point, uh, my work is starting to cue really close to principles of game design. Let me show you some stuff. Here are some interior pictures. Uh, so over here, all these props here are made by the children that we were working with. They built most of the props um, and they did almost all of the set dressing for the space themselves. Here's an example of some of the props they built in lockers that we built. I mean, they also built the lockers. Um, and again, you see a bulletin board. Uh, basically everything on this bulletin board, I think, except for the lost rover sign, um, was made by one of the kids. And here's a couple more images of what they made or modified. And a couple more pictures. So let's talk about how this all worked between uh, me and this project. So part of this build process was very much inspired by role-playing games like D&D uh, and LARP, live action role-play. So what I did is I had kids fill out character sheets. Um, I had them make a prop that their characters might have, and then we populated the sets with it. This experience was actually really formative in how I will think to how I will come to think about keepsake games, because I was suddenly implementing all these ideas that I'd been experimenting with in much smaller collaborative crews that I was leading myself. Um, but in this build, I was essentially drafting instructions and plans and handing them over to a very competent team. Um, it was also a team that consisted of 100 children. So there had to be space for play, and there had to be space to see things change, and there had to be space for the team again, a team with 100 children, to have ownership and agency over the space they were building. Um, I designed a structure in a very, very literal sense, but they would have to make it an inhabited and narrative space. Um, and after doing that, it really made me feel like, oh, I can write game instructions that ask people to do something um, and let them have agency there and just be surprised and delighted with what, uh, what they produce. So I'd been asking my crew members to inhabit the role of someone that existed in the universe they were building and to craft props that reflected that role for several years. But as part of the world building class in preparation for the salvage station art installation, we formalized that process. So kids would fill out these, um, these character sheets and they would use it as a starting point for their ideation process and for their prop building. Some of this obviously comes from D&D character sheets, but some of it is also putting down acting and writing exercises down in a pretty accessible format. Here's the second page of that. Oh my God, sorry, this dog situation is absurd. Um, some of the questions I hold in my head when filling these spaces and designing objects to fill these spaces are the following. For example, um, the object in the picture here, which is also designed for the apothecary, is called a moon drake. So how did it get here? It's cultivated by outer colonists. What does it do? It's a medicinal and herbal cure for many maladies and illnesses. What story can we tell? We hint at a world where people on the edges of the universe have cultivated their own medicines and created 
a certain freedom from pharmaceutical companies. All of this is basically just summarized on that little label. And it's also just what that object is. And we take it and we put it in art installation and we fill the space with so many of these little objects. And suddenly it's a space with so many jumping off points um, for player and participant stories. So the question I'm essentially asking with all this work is how do we fill spaces with thoughtful objects that are in and of themselves narratively compelling? And the obvious answer to me is to just consider the things that we consider important. We like things, like just as regular humans, we love things. We surround ourselves every day with objects that are important to us. And we can take them one step further by going through the thought processes which immerse us in our own lives or our character lives. Um, so think for a second about the objects that you personally choose to surround yourself with. What do these objects say about you? What did they say about your history? What did they say about your personality? Don't just think of, think of the things that you need to do your job or the things you need generally, but think of the things that represent you the most. What are the things that bring you joy and the things that are most representative of the inner core of you? One of the things that we often forget when populating a set or an installation piece is that many people often just think of the first level, which is basically, what's the shit we all own? For instance, if you were designing a cubicle, what goes in there? Got all the tools you need, the keyboard monitor, the keyboard, the lamp, the office supplies. All right. And even there, you've got some choices to make. For instance, what does using this stapler as a prop say? Well, it's a pretty ordinary stapler. It doesn't say much. What does using this stapler as a prop say? There's a little more personality. Only a specific type of person is likely to own this, um, this stapler. What is using this stapler as a prop say? This is a stapler I would pick. It is weird, it is retro, and it looks like a whale. It's perfect. So when you move on to the next level of thinking of what props go into a cubicle like this, you probably think of the sentimental. So a family photo, a plant, something that looks like a child's drawing. Most prop work, you're gonna think about this far. And then we get to the really, really fun stuff, like the weird specific items. Like, why would you have three rubber ducks on a cubicle? Why would you have action figures on a cubicle? These things do not really have to be explained, but they provide a real glimpse of the person who exists in that space. And then, I personally love this part the most, there's a detritus. Detritus is a symbol of time. It's a stuff that happens when a space is truly, truly lived in. It's the shit that gathers up over time. So the receipts from lunches, the impersonal birthday cards, the punch cards for the coffee places, the coffee cup, which has like branded pens from vendors, the five different coffee cups from work events. These are all symbols of detritus. So what goes in a space? Um, so we've got Practical and useful things. These are generally symbols of occupation, things you need for the job at hand, sentimental objects, which are symbols of community, um, specific objects, these are symbols of personality, and detritus, which are symbols of time. And the amazing thing is that these are all things you expect in the space. So the lack of any one of these things, especially in contrast with a space that does have them, um, is also a function of world building. Like, what if you had a space like this that had no symbols of community whatsoever? It immediately says, oh, this person's a lonely person. So that's something that is also important in what we're talking about. Physical objects help us create worlds by giving us these jumping points uh, for role play and also gives us tokens of belonging. The thing about spaces is that people inhabit them. I know that it seems like I'm saying really, really obvious things, but even the concept of set design, which is what I do, we're often limited by what's in the script. And the thing is that that's not really true. Because um, what happens when we think of the other people that might exist in the same universe? What is going outside the structure that a show or a story takes place in? For instance, this is the postcard I designed for the apothecary. It's for a space salvage union, which establishes the inhabitants of this universe as largely blue collar workers. So even if this is a space that has no people and no actors in it, 
except for the people experiencing the installation, it assures you that this was still a once inhabited space. Physical objects are essential to intimate world building, but we don't just have to think of practical objects. We can invent strange, new, and delightful things that just hold whole stories in and of themselves. These are space safety leeches. I'm using a lot of examples from the last pop here because they're really fun. The idea behind this um, is that they're basically mine canaries. So you stick one to you, the radiation is too high, they fall off. Um, this was an idea that one of my crew members threw out. It's brilliant. This is such a cheap prop. It's essentially packaging design. We left a bunch of the counters on the apothecary. The leeches are just off the shelf fish bait. They smell terrible, um, but the rest is just paper design paper bags. You don't have to answer all the questions that are posed by these objects. You don't have to tell your audience who Captain Jones is. Jones is. Um, you don't have to explain who uses them. By just creating the structures of these universes, dropping in some story seeds and inviting your audience to play, you're collaborating with them to create an even bigger narrative that either one of you would have made on your own. Another world building Emma and I love is rituals and traditions. A theme I've been exploring over the last few years is divination and ritual, specifically new invented ones. And this is actually exactly how I found my way into games. I was adding all of these rituals into my ex experiential design work, these collections of systems of divination and instructions for play. And at some point I'm like, wait, I'm making game systems and I'm making instructions on how to play them. It all became really obvious. This is a space hobo divination board. It's a fortune telling system, just practiced by spacefarers that involves throwing bottle caps on a bandana. This is a rebuild of a capsule toy machine. It is literally an interactive toy. Um, all right, let's get talking about games. I'm trying to talk pretty fast so we actually get to it. Um, at this point in my installation work, I am pretty deeply entrenched in games. I bring this project, which is the Oracle Bird card to indicate 2019, and I perform it there and I feel really at home and I'm like, yes, this is what I wanted to do. And then the pandemic hits. Um, so you might imagine immersive theater, large scale art installation work, any sort of event work, anything that allows me to hire a crew, all of that goes away. And I have a decent amount of time on my hands. So I start thinking of ways to bring these large scale immersive installations into small home spaces. And that leads me to keepsake games. I'm the person to first define keepsake games as a term based on my own body of work and my collaboration with Jian Shim on Field Guide to Memory. So I'm gonna go ahead and define it here for you. Sorry, water. <laughs> a, um, a keepsake game is a game where the process of playing the game creates a memorable physical artifact. That means that the design process must be intentional. The creation of the physical object by the player is a necessary part of playing a keepsake game. So a game that just has really cool objects and tokens that you might wanna keep, as beautiful as it is, is still not a keepsake game because the player isn't making these cool objects. A journaling game that incidentally a player makes a really cool scrapbook out of, the player may have made it a keepsake game, um, but the intentional structure of the game itself was not a keepsake game, even though it can be played as one. This is not a new form, um, but it has always been explained with other game terms as a subset of other games. And because my work was so specifically centered around the creation of narrative objects, it felt really useful, if absolutely self-indulgent, to have this very self-explanatory term to work with. And I see keepsake games as the ability to imbue even simple objects with story and emotion, and that matters. A thing that comes up a lot with crafters is a sunk cost fallacy. When you work on something and then you don't wanna work on it anymore, you're stuck with this half-finished project that you might finish someday. But I actually wanna make the entire process of making feel rewarding. And I also want to make it to feel okay to stop. So ultimately, keepsake games are a method of guiding people into writing a story and making an object. You're building both a collaborative narrative and a collaborative artwork. And that is so amazing to me. So many of the principles here are influenced by my background in immersive installation art. But I really loved the fact that I could now reach so many people and also make my work so much more accessible while also lifting significant, significantly fewer four by eight sheets of heavy plywood.
because I'm getting old and I just can't do the things I did when I was young. Um, there are some personal ethical rules that I like to use in my own design work where I want the physical artifact produced to be something not easily disposable. This is part of the heart of why I gravitate towards the concept of keepsake games, which is I think part of the ethos of crafting, right? We want to make things that are specifically not mass produced commercial things. We want to create items that are memorable and treasured and kept. And if we think about the things that are most sentimental about in the world, Many of those things are beautifully crafted objects, like, sorry, let me sneeze. Oh. All right, things like quilts from grandma or, <laughs> sorry, um, or even like a sweater and X made, but you might find that a lot of them are actually kind of ordinary. And when they're ordinary, um, like things, I have a pint glass that I bought at a dollar store my first semester of college the first time I've ever bought housewares for myself. Um, sorry about the sneezing. Um, I have a pot holder I stole from an artist residency. Uh, it was a free pot holder. It was given out by an auto parts store. But there's so many things in my life that bring me joy. And they're objects that I deeply associate with people or a moment or a story. Um, the story is what makes it keepable. So on the practical level, if any, one, any of you are already prose writers, which I know some of you may be, the awesome thing about game writing is writing games like this means that you don't have to write the whole book. Um, that's part of the joy of being a game designer. You're designing systems that enable people to create their own stories. You're building structures of fillable creative space. And I feel that one of the crucial elements of the effectiveness of a game like a keepsake game is how you trick. Uh, I mean, you're guiding, but there's definitely an element of subterfuge. You're tricking people into telling interesting, complex stories. You're making beautiful handmade objects and you're giving your players the agency to take your delicate, beautiful narrative structure and, uh, and break it. So it's an absolute honor when people remix my games into something I barely recognize. So in a sense, solo tabletop games, something which is absolutely extended to keepsake games, they're fundamentally games about making space and holding space for the player to tell their own stories. So keepsake games are a new term, but this kind of game is not new. And we're all building on a history of what came before us. So it's a very incomplete list, but I wanted to paint as direct a lineage as possible of my own influences. So Fluxus was an avant-garde art movement that emerged in the late 1950s and continued through the 60s and 70s and continues until today. It was centered around a group of artists who had become disenchanted with the art world, which they felt was very elitist. The works that I'm most interested in as a concept of a designer are their concept of event scores. They are essentially instructions, maybe a bit more poetry to it, they embrace the use of ordinary and accessible materials. And the central tenet of these scores was that art could be made and performed by anyone. And event scores were largely about process and not results. This is an example of um, proposition, what's the name says? Uh, proposition one, make a salad by Alison Knowles. Um, here's an image of it being performed in 1965 where the salad is being made out of a pickle barrel. And more recently, where it's being made out of, a, out of a tarp, which honestly, I think is kind of gross, but this is all part of the performance. Um, another crucial figure is Yoko Ono. She wrote a book called Grapefruit, which collects uh, many of her, uh, what are essentially event scores. And these are very inspirational to me. Uh, one of my favorite shirts is a shirt that says, uh, John Lennon broke up fluxes. It's not entirely true, it's still going. Um, and these are a few more examples of her works uh, in Grapefruit. Um, the AIDS Memorial quilt um, is one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And I do feel like it is a pinnacle of collaborative storytelling through craft. Um, it's such an expansive, empathetic, and intimate community project. And uh, I wish it didn't have to happen, but the work itself is stunning and it's all inducing. This is one of my favorite examples of an unintentional keepsake game. 
it is truly perfect on so, so many levels. It works on so many fronts. It works on, it's a data science project. It's a project about archiving. It's a project about memory. It is a literal record of where the knitter lives. It is ritual and it is practice. It is so hard to get people to dedicate even a little bit of time every day to playing a game regularly. But to make these scarves, knitters knit a row every single day. And it's so rooted in community. So many of these scarves have been made, they've been shared in Ravelry and elsewhere. Um, and it's very political. This scarf is political because climate change is political. So this card, uh, this scarf is fundamentally political. Um, it does so many things and it's incredible to me and just a source of inspiration. Most of all, this is a beautiful object. It will be kept and it will be treasured. This is something that is so often at the forefront of my brain uh, because it does what I want my games to do so perfectly. So how the climate scarf works is you check the weather daily. Each weather range is linked to a color, usually one that is also a visual indicator of a weather, the weather, and you knit a single row with that yarn. And when you're done with it, you end up with a whole scarf that uh, documents the climate change of your year. It's amazing. Uh, this is a quick look at A Thousand Year Old Vampire by Tim Hutchings. It's a very well-known journaling game. Um, it features randomized prompts that cover uh, the centuries of a vampire's existence. Um, it's about failings, loss, hard decisions, and you kind of create a character sheet and journal. A very inspiring thing to me um, in the process of making keepsake games is an illustrator, Tim Dene, illustrated his playthrough of Thousand Year Vampire, and the results are so delightful. And again, this just goes straight to the heart of making keepsake games, because it's about creating structure that other people can then use to make and guide their own art. Uh, the Quiet Year by Avery Alder is another huge point of inspiration. Um, it is a weak time-based game. Um, there are 52 cards, and the, card prom the cards prompt you to answer a question and modify the map. So here's the exa an example of a map that someone creates uh, through the process of playing this game. Um, I try not to talk about my games a ton, but I'm gonna talk about a couple of them because I can describe them pretty well and clue you into the choices I make with them. Uh, Field Guide to Memory was a collaboration between me and Jian Shim. It is a journaling game, but it was a game where we really saw the value of co codifying a term for the kind of game that this was, which is a game that pushed people towards making and crafting in a very communal way. So I intentionally created artifacts that were printable that were sent to people daily and players were encouraged to scrapbook and experience this game in as, in an, in an, as immersive a way that we could manage. But there were many objects that exist in the game that really translated to objects that could also exist in the world. So a player received a letter in the mail, they could print out that letter, but clipping if an obituary was referenced, they could print it out. Um, even our stories from guest writers were presented as documents. So I felt that this game was very successful, not just as being a journaling game, but one that really insisted on being a keepsake game because the intention of this game in its design choices and structure was to guide the player in creating a physical object. And here are some examples of the physical journals that people created while playing this game. Um, after that, I designed a game called Amending. It uh, combines embroidery and narrative prompts and map marking to tell a story about your relationship with a distant friend. Um, it is a sewing game, but it can also be played, uh, but it is played by marking, it can also be played on paper, and it's played by marking your house and your friend's house on a map and you begin a journey towards them. So uh, a cloth mat was shipped with the game. This is a picture of the paper version. Uh, you would embroider that journey and at minimum you'd be sewing a line for the pack. And every time you crossed a grid line, you'd pull, pull a card that had a story prompt. Um, these cards were modeled on Alex Roberts's For the Queen, which is a card deck based storytelling game. Most of the games mentioned here are largely prompt based and they're storytelling games. That's just at the heart of the kind of games I love making. Um, so a picture of the scarf, of the a finished map being worn as a bandana. And this is a picture, this is ab absurd. Um, a grandma made this. I believe like her, one of her grandchildren gave her this game as a gift. She's not a gamer, but she is an embroiderer. Um, and she turned her finished map into this absolutely amazing quilt. And this really became a game that people would play um, across generations. It was a game that um, 
a lot of dudes who loved games would buy for their wives and they would ask their wives or mothers to teach them how to sew. Um, so it, it was really sweet how, um, how really unexpected connections were made uh, from this game. Uh, another game of mine, Remember August, this is a game played entirely by a male. Uh, the Keepsake is a collection of letters produced. It was a live game. So over the course of a month, players received eight letters from their friend who had been lost in time. Uh, one of my most straightforward examples of a keepsake game, it was really inspired by Nick Bantock's Griffin and Sabine books. Um, so the keepsake from this game are the letters you write to August combined with the letters August writes to you. So you now have an epistolary story about your strange friendship. Um, here's an image of some of the pieces that were part of this. Um, and here are some of the artifacts that people made uh, while they were playing this game. Um, this one is just a fake yearbook. Someone just, you know, mocked up a fake yearbook with their friend August in it. Uh, these are some letters that people uh, played as part of the game, used as part of the game. Uh, and this is just an indulgent image of my typewriter, which I love very dearly. So one of the things I think about a lot is, as game designers, how do we create a welcoming space, both in design and content, that welcomes players? And this is especially relevant with keepsake games because we are asking our players to do something new in terms of exploring a new craft. As players, how do we move past the barrier of being asked to do something that we're not entirely comfortable with? Um, I don't mean content. Um, I mean getting over that initial barrier of working with your hands and of crafting something. Um, even though some of us may already be experienced crafters, we want to lean into making games that honor our skill and honor our experience, but also remain welcoming to people who know nothing about it and are maybe even a little scared of it. So this is one of my first keepsake games before I really began to shape the idea of what a keepsake game was in my head. Um, this was a casual LARP, it's still running, but uh, it was a small postcard LARP where a hundred people wrote postcards to each other as space gnomes. And um, after they received their pre-stamped postcards, they would have a full set of these postcards and all the corresponding notes that other people would write to them. But the important part is that everyone would have three new pen pals and they could choose to continue that in, char in character. This was a pretty, pretty small ask. It was, can you write a postcard? That's it. This is a very simple, um, thing that was pretty easy to do because most of the games I make have a very low barrier to entry. Remember August and Field Guide, these are games that are played with pen and paper. Amending is a slightly higher bar to entry. It does require you to get some craft and uh, embroidery supplies, but um, it's pretty cheap to do so. And if you know anyone at all who sews and embroiders, they're gonna beg you to take their supplies. Um, a lot of people who gave amending as a gift also created their own curated embroidery kits um, for recipients, generally out of their own collections, um, which is really delightful. It's like they became game designers even before, just in the process of like giving the game as a gift. Um, so how do we message to complete beginners that they are absolutely ready to take on a new craft just to play a game? Well, here's one example, um, embroidery. It's fairly low barrier of entries. You do have to, to be good at it. You're gonna have to put a lot of work of practice in, but to generally put thread and needle and cloth, that doesn't, that doesn't cost much at all. But how do we get people to make that very first step? Well, this is my favorite trick in the book. You provide an example and not a particularly good one. Here's one of the promotional images I used for amending. As creators, we sometimes need to put aside our actual level of skill. We've got to set that aside in the interest of making our, our stories a lot more welcoming. Uh, fortunately, in this specific case, I actually am no good at embroidery, so it worked out. But at the same time, you can trust your audience, both their conscious and subconscious instincts. So let's talk a little bit about the motions of everyday life that people are already primed to accept. Um, so let's talk about them and how they make you feel. Here's an example. Someone's running at you while yelling. How do you feel about that? Generally gonna feel fear, gonna feel anxiety. There's an immediate transference from what the person is feeling to you. So this feeling can be something that can be transferred fairly easily as part of a game. Um, like, you know, you send someone a ransom note in the mail, people are going to feel fear. 
That's just like an image that they're accustomed to dealing with. Some are more vague. Here's another example. A tall, beautiful woman on the street smiles at you. How do you feel? A tall, beautiful man on the street smiles at you. How you feel? This is something that has truly variable emotional results. Some people love being smiled at on the street. Some people are instantly suspicious. Some people hate it. Some people might be chill with a beautiful woman, but not a man. Depending on intersections of sexuality, trauma, attraction, introversion, people are very likely to have different responses. Here's something that I've been playing with that has weirdly consistent results. You'll, you're standing at a counter behind a cash register and someone walks up. Generally, your instinct will be to say, oh, can I help you? <clears throat> I first started thinking about counters when I went to see a production of Sleep No More. Um, there was a candy shop and a counter and an audience member was standing behind it and he was grabbing candy and offering it to other audience members. Um, and we didn't speak, but he was definitely making gestures that were like, can I help you? Would you like some of this? Um, and I started thinking, how do we get audience members to play? How do we get them to interact with our work? Um, I wanted to find out. So I went with, all right, counters, let's do it. Um, I put a counter in one of my Burning Man installations in um, uh, Burning Man 2018. This is the last pop carry. And people just played. A bartender brought his whole portable bar kit and some mixers over, and he just parked himself behind the counter and made drinks for a few hours. Um, an herbalist came over and she dispensed advice for a while. People just used the space and they played along. People role played, they hung out, they inhabited the space. So now that we've come full circle to that question, I've been mulling over for some years now. I've been trying to recreate this feeling of having people take my work and then run with it to make their own art. So how do we create in games that feeling of curiosity? And how do we create invitations to play? How do we get people to just make something? Well, I'm still finding out, but I am really excited about exploring with Keepsake Games as a form because I think there's really something there that's going to help me answer this question. So here's my closing pitch for making Keepsake Games. First, I want us to be able to reconnect with making things and doing things with our hands with the same childlike curiosity of making mud pies or stick dolls or honestly, even just like sticking forks into electrical sockets. Um, I want us to have that moment of discovery. Um, I'm completely immersed in digital, you know, everything, of course. It is a regular and necessary part of my life. But for me, there will always be something visceral and real about touching and making things. Um, secondly, the fast consumer cycle is a blight on this earth. We buy so many wasteful things that end up in landfills. And part of what Keepsake Games do is they connect us with our own abilities to entertain ourselves while also suggesting that we do, if we do have the skill to make simple things, we also have the skills to make more complicated things. They ask us to see the value in things that already exist in our lives and to reinterpret them in interesting ways. And I think it's a really natural thing that happens. When you start thinking in this way, you learn to reuse, you learn to repair things. Um, I've taught a couple of longer classes on keepsake games. I see some familiar names. Um, and a lot of students really naturally gravitated towards games that make use of like your craft stash or make, thing, uh, make use of things that you just already have. And many others just really gravitated towards ephemeral things when the physical object was physical and still beautiful, but ephemeral, like a meal or a tea blend. So I want us to make things that are important and are worth keeping. And how we do that is we know we keep sentimental objects. We know we keep objects with story. So we can give those objects story and we can give them ritual and we can give them narratives and build narratives with them and in them that are important and lovely to us. And finally, Keepsake Games are very intentionally rooted in collaboration. As designers, we build structures and playgrounds for our, our audiences, for our players to make their own stories and beautiful objects. A Keepsake Game is 
fundamentally a collaborative work, and it needs to be. It is an instruction manual, it's a series of prompts, it's a series of unfinished stories. Um, the designer can only ever always write a portion of the story, and the story is neither alive nor is it complete without the player. And uh, it is in the spirit of collaboration that I'll end this lecture. Um, I hope I have planted some seeds in your brain that will become something bigger than I could ever make myself. Uh, thank you so much for coming and listening. I hope you will make something beautiful. Yay, I have talked. Um, all right, I will now stop sharing and uh, we have some time for questions. So I don't think there's like a Q and A. So just uh, ask questions or type them in the chat or just go off mute and ask. My dog is now curled up in a sleep. It's really cute. So I have a question. Um, and actually, let me turn my camera on. I was just fidgeting this whole time. Um, hello, sorry for the lighting. I don't have main lighting in here. Um, for someone, so I really like the concept of prop making, but I'm not very good at it. So for someone, I really liked those prompt questions, but what would you recommend as like a starting material or like if you just want to make something small and non-functional, like maybe like that Moondrake you called it, like just something for the sake of filling a space imaginary wise? Yeah, yeah. Um, I recommend probably the most immediate thing is paper. Paper right. is cheap. It's really easy. Um, you can produce like notes and letters and flyers. Um, and these are things that just really fill a space. Um, another thing I'd recommend, like um, things that I was teaching children to do, is very straightforward stuff like jars. Um, like specimen jars, which can be, you know, they can be very clean and sort of fit in a science fiction environment. They can be very dirty and kind of be in a more Halloween-y situation. Um, and then, you know, just doing very entry level things because I know you say you're not good at them now, but once you start, you get, you actually tend to get better really fast. I do have um, experience with that, but you know, it's just not something I'm skilled at yet. So. Oh yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, repetition. Another thing that I, that I love is actually, um, I, I talk about these in my keepsake games cl class, but klutz kits. Klutz kits. Yeah. You know, those kits that are made for children that are. Oh, like, those. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, yes, I they have. Start, oh. They start with, they, you know, with like, this is how you make a friendship bracelet, but they've gotten like surprisingly complicated now, you know, and they actually teach like basic prop making skills like really well, you know, um, right. and a lot of the things there can just really easily be reused for other things. Uh, right. Yeah. I love, right. love Klutz kits. Cool. Uh, I will definitely keep that in mind. And I will be checking out the A mending because I can oh, sew a little do. bit. I actually have a little guy of mine. I didn't make his outfit, oh but gosh. I made him. That's <laughs> amazing. His um, name's Lucky. Um, Lucky. Uh, I will also yeah. like weirdly say, um, you don't have to be good at the craft to design a game. Uh, duly <laughs> noted. Makes other people do that craft. Like me, <laughs> I can barely sew. Made a sewing game anyway. Um, all, all right, right. We need a couple other questions. Um, right. Thank you very much. There are many different frameworks for creating classical board video games, some of which apply better to certain situations than others. Do you have a particular strategy or framework that you use for making keepsake games or a specific design process? Um, I am a person who tends to work backwards. Um, I often start with the thing I want, the object that I want to be produced. Um, and I will tend to work backwards on figuring out how to get to that craft or how to build an interesting narrative um, that leads to that craft. And part of that design process is that, you know, part of being a game designer is you have certain things you just tend to fall back on. Like I love prompts. I love dice roll tables. Um, I love, oh my gosh, what other things do I love? I love maps. Uh, and oftentimes, yeah, I do. I, I fall back a lot on the things that I know I love. I love letters um, and I love the USPS. So, so many of my games are about mail. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, let's see other questions. Oh, uh, I think the classroom has a question. 
Yeah, so I, I had a, a question or comment. Um, so you were talking about counters and the power of counters. Um, and I, I ran into the same thing in a, in a former life before I was a game design professor or video game designer. Um, I worked as a interaction designer for uh, a number of different Renaissance fairs. And um, we did stage shows and we did audience interaction and audience interaction was really challenging because when a strange looking person in a costume runs up to you, you run away. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So, you know, we'd have situations where enthusiastic new improv people are chasing uh, mm -hmm. audience members all over the fair and it wasn't great. Um, and uh, so we uh, built these installations for people to come up and interact with people at like, oh, there's a fairy tree and the fairies are dancing around the tree. And all of the audience members avoid the trees like, like there was a plague. Um, because you know, they, if they go close, then they might be accosted by these interactive actors, and we wouldn't want that. Um, and then we had a group of Vikings who had a historical encampment with a fire, and we were like, well, because of the, the flames, we can't just have like two-year-olds running into this campfire, so we put up a rope around the area. And all of a sudden, there was a crowd of people standing around the rope waiting yes. to interact with the Vikings. Uh -huh. And we had created a counter, right? We yep. had created a thing that people understood to be uh, like protective of them, uh, separating them and defining the scope of the interaction. You're on the other side of that rope. The rope was like knee high, right? Like it wasn't like yeah. it was actually separating them, but the symbolic like separation was enough that all of a sudden people swarmed it and we had just all day interaction. Um, so I think that that uh, defining the scope of the interaction and uh, making it so that the the person engaging in what whether it's the act of creating something for a keepsake or a, or a social interaction, they know the definition of that and, and they feel safe in it yes. uh, is is a big part. I think what you were saying about um, having a low bar of entry. If you establish that the bar of entry is low and defined with a prompt or yeah. with a kit that you can interact with, then you're creating something that is a counter uh, for the player, you know, metaphorically to interact Absolutely. with your game. So I think that is is like the the salient observation from your from your talk that resonates most strongly with me. So thank you. Uh, that wasn't a question, but thank you. Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, so much about just having, you know, building those structures and containers of safety and comfort um, that then allow people to play. Um, I will read a couple, I'm not going to read this entire question, uh, but Marvin, who's also from Malaysia, where are you from? I'm from Malacca. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to summarize the very end. Um, I feel that thinking, um, Oh, that's awesome. My, my dad is, my dad's from there. He's from, uh, anyway, I'll carry on. Uh, <laughs> um, I feel that thinking about things in terms of languages can bring profound insights. How do keepsake game transform how we think about languages and how we communicate with each other, even across time? That is such a good question. And I honestly have no idea how to answer it. Um, like I, I will be thinking about this question for a good long while, um, but I actually don't think I can answer it off the top of my head. But I will recommend for everyone uh, the game called Dialect. It's by Thorny Games. Um, and it is a game about building a language uh, collaboratively. If someone could drop a link to it, um, that would be amazing. And they are the people who I want um, to answer this question because they've obviously thought about it so much. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. I, I think it's great. Um, next question is, are keepsake games essentially games that guide the player to make an object that is meaningful to them? Um, I would say, yeah, the first half of the sentence. Um, by definition, keepsake games are games that guide the player to make an object. Um, whether it is meaningful to them is you know, part of your work as a designer, but uh, I would not say it necessarily has to be meaningful. I just obviously think that game design is more fun when you're creating meaningful work. Um, I Oh, Fox had their hand up. Yes, hi. First of all, um, this was so amazing. I've been in the sort of like orbit of wanting to play Amending for so long and it's, it's sitting in my cart. So I'm gonna definitely, you know, <laughs> take the plunge. Um, but yeah, all your inspirations were amazing. Like seeing Fluxus, seeing Quiet Year, all of it just culminated to such a cohesive, beautiful message about your game making process. 
it's fantastic. Um, so my question, I teach here at Northeastern and I love analog games, but a lot of my students, some of them in the chat here, they're a little more drawn to digital games. Um, and I think it makes sense, you know, being a game design student. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how to translate the the tangible, the physicality of like keepsake games and keepsake objects into something more ephemeral and digital? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I've done sort of adaptations into digital, um, like the Gentle Oracle Bird, which is the, the kind of fortune telling game. It also existed until very recently uh, because the Twitter API fell apart. Um, it until very recently existed as a Twitter bot, so you could interact with her, with the, the oracle bird that way. Um, I've done other fortune telling uh, divination games like, you know, on itch. Um, and that's all stuff using twine that essentially produces, uh, you know, fortune readings based on various like real world variables. Um, but, you know, to be perfectly honest, I don't think a lot about translating keepsake games into digital because I mean there's not really any lack of digital games and analog is my particular passion um so if anything what I do a lot of is I I teach a very a games workshop class at USC um so a lot of what I do is take a lot of students who've done a lot of digital work and being like let's take those concepts and translate them into analog stuff because this is stuff that we can make and prototype really quickly um and i find that that actually becomes very appealing to them like the fact that they can make a game basically themselves or with a very small team in just a couple weeks um becomes very satisfying and i think it's really fun to kind of get hooked on that feeling of like oh my god i've designed something like which i love digital games but you know what they take so long <laughs> Yeah, that was perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a question here from the class. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so my, uh, my name's Grant, um, game design student here. And uh, actually, my, my passion in gaming is actually in like board games and like, you know, some more traditional analog games. Um, so during your talk, I was thinking about uh, legacy games, if you, uh, if you know what those are, uh, you they, they just like oh yeah 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 games. yeah um, those games and also Oath. If you know that game, um, basically Oath is like a game where uh, like the first play is the only play that'll be the same for every person. After each play, the 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 different powers like change. Uh, the mode of winning the game changes. And basically, it's based off of whoever won and where everyone was at the last play. And I was thinking about that as like a type of more traditional, uh, like board game um, that could still be sort of like a keepsake game, uh, sort of. It's not not exactly, but like uh, uh, I, I don't really have a question. I was just thinking about it oh no, no you're right like you saying that um i feel like oath falls more into like being a legacy game kind mm -hmm. of the book. but i actually feel like I, I don't actually know if anyone's really explored this yet um but exploring the idea of like a keepsake legacy game where the first player makes something and then part of the game process is actually to just hand it off to someone else um, to continue from wherever they they left off. Um, and I think that there, there's so many good ideas in there that could be that could be something more. Um, I think the game uh, Fall of Magic, while you don't oh, visit yes. for the game board, if you've ever played even part of a game of Fall of Magic, you can't look at that game board without it being about your journey in that game or your, your group of players' journey in that game. And the, the physicality of, of that product, uh, it's it's a game where it's created on a scroll that's like yes. nine feet long. I'm describing it to the class, I mean, you've, you've seen it. But um, And as you start playing the game, you start unrolling the scroll and moving your token across the board as you're telling what happens in different scenes. And so you keep revealing this sort of wonderfully tactile canvas map as you're unrolling the scroll. Um, it's very, very neat. Uh, part of the Dernicorn uh, is the company that makes it. 
Yeah, everything Heart of the Deer Unicorn does is absolutely yeah. beautiful. Um, yeah, and, and they actually produce all their stuff in-house too. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah Fall yeah. Magic is absolutely beautiful. I believe they actually, they make Quiet Year as well. Mm-hmm. And they just released uh, um, City of Winter. Uh, they do a game called BFF that is about being a preteen girl uh, in a friend's group. They're absolutely heart- heartwarming games. They're great. Uh, another question from the class. Hi, my name is Aaron. And um, during your talk, I was struck by how closely related a lot of your work is to design fiction. Is that like a genre of art that you're um, that you were influenced by uh, when creating your works? Uh, sort of, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, like, when you mentioned it, I was kind of like, have I thought about this for a very, like, I have not thought about it for a very long time. But the moment you said so, I was like, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> it's just been a really long time since I've thought about it. So it was, you weren't like consciously drawing on like um, inspiration from, from design fiction, but rather it was like kind of in your subconscious. And in- yeah, yeah, I think so. I think like the most obvious influences on my art have actually been games. Um, like I feel like I was very intentionally kind of resisting um, resisting the art world and the design world. And I was like, no, I am a technician. I build sets. Um, I build, now I build large installations that are very much inspired by like video games, um, that are rooted in like my skill as a production designer. Um, and it's actually now that I'm making games and I'm kind of coming back to a lot of art movements that are inspiring, that are inspiring to me, like fluxes. And I will, I will, Kind of come around to design fiction and be like, yeah, I think I think so actually. Um, does anyone have any other questions? I also wanted to say thank you to you for the uh, categorization of kinds of objects that are found in spaces. Um, I, I teach a level design class and spend a lot of time telling students, put more things in this space. Uh, like, more think things. More carefully about what, why the things are in the space and what they're there for. And I think your, your breakdown of these are four different kinds of or categories of things that are probably in a space that's lived in uh, will be really helpful. And I'm going to use that in my classes going forward. So thank you. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. Um, all right. I mean, I think we're sort of at time. So thank you all for coming. Um, I really appreciate y'all coming out. It was just a joy to talk to you. And uh, yeah, I, I hope I hope you take away lots of interesting things and make wonderful games, which I'm sure you are. <laughs>